you are in our, in our first session of the Equipped to Proclaim Apologetics Training Series. Um, as you all know, this is an exercise 16 week, 16 credit hour training program. And our vision and our, our aspiration is that you would be equipped to proclaim the gospel confidently to your friends, your colleagues, um, wherever you are. And uh, just to give an outlay of what we'll be looking at today, as you know, we have two modules. And this session is part of the first module, which is an introductory module. And then we will have, after the introductory module finishes, which will span about six sessions, we will have the core module, which will span 10 sessions. So in the introductory module, we'll be going through introductory content. So as our guest speaker is gonna talk about the relevance of apologetics, it's an introductory content. And uh, we will look at introduction to theology as such. And down the line, in the core module, we'll look into core apologetics content. So we will keep you posted and updated about all of that. But thank you so much for registering, for showing your interest to be here and for being here as well. Um, I would like to start off with a short word of prayer. And for that, um, I would like to call upon our Ajit Angul to start the meeting with a short word of prayer. Lovely. Father, we, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Father, we thank you for this wonderful time that you've given us, Lord. Lord, as we have gathered together to learn from the scripture and to uh, understand the challenges that we could face during sharing the word with others, Lord, and to overcome those challenges by the word of God that is being shared in this program. Lord Almighty, we commit uh, the servant of God uh, in your hands that every word which proceeds from his mouth be ordained and blessed by you, Lord. Help each one of us, Lord, that who are part partaking in this program, are empowered, may learn, and may become more confident, and uh, uh, which will help us to win souls and pull out many people from eternal death into eternal life. Lord, we thank you. Thank you for the organizers. Uh, each one of us, Lord, help us that we may focus. We may come give complete uh, uh, attention to this course, and this may become a great blessing for our lives. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that you have heard our prayers. In Jesus' most precious name we pray. Amen. So before we jump right in, I just want to once again thank WCC Church and the leadership and pastor, especially for giving the immense support and encouragement for the start of this session. As chapter directors, Chris, I, Alan, we all um, understand the difficulty of getting a chapter off the ground. So we're thankful to God for the church. And um, we have Alan here. You may see him, uh, Alan John. Alan is a very good friend of mine and also our chapter director in Salem. Alan is part of the Reasonable Faith Malayalam Translation Video Work Team. So I'm excited to have him here as well. Um, now, without further ado, I want Chris to have as much as time that we have allotted to him. So Chris is a Reasonable Faith Chapter Director in Alaska. A great friend of mine and Chris also works with law enforcement agencies. I know that Chris has some really exciting cop stories ready to uh, fill in in between as he takes to us to the session. So without much ado, Chris, over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Can uh, just give me a thumbs up, Jacob, if you can hear me. I just want to make sure we're all good. Oh, excellent. Excellent. I appreciate you all coming together and providing me this opportunity to share with you how Christian apologetics has become and is now integrated in, in every aspect of my life. I, I also want to thank Jacob for thinking of me and offering me this opportunity. As I sit here today speaking with you, the calling God has placed on my life to serve as a pastor, but specifically as a Christian apologist, uh, is clear. But as is often the case, the road to realize my calling was and sometimes is still winding as we try to find where God wants us to be and how we can serve. I want to start off with one, if not the guiding Bible verse for apologists, which is 1 Peter 3.15, where as many of you I'm sure know it states, but in your hearts regard Christ the Lord as holy, ready at any time to give a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Many of us as apologists focus on the word defense, which is translated from the Greek word apologia. As you can see over my shoulder here, I have that written there to remind me every day. But before we can defend the hope that's within us, we must firmly understand and grasp that hope that can only be found in the assurance of forgiveness and salvation we have through our faith in Jesus Christ. Now, today's 
topic is why is apologetics relevant to me? And I'm fortunate to have grown up in a Christian house and have had a relationship with Christ for as long as I can remember. But I grew up in a loving home with few truly dark moments. You know, my family placed a great importance on doing the right thing. And you've cut, you couple that with a childhood of reading superhero comic books about Batman and Superman. Uh, I wanted to be a superhero myself. I wanted to make a change and I wanted to help people. So right after college, I became a police officer in Texas and I cut my teeth on the Bryan police force. I investigated murders, I dug up dead bodies, I arrested rapists and pedophiles, and I learned that there really are monsters who just cared nothing about hurting the weaker and the innocent. And the depravity of mankind was on full display. Uh, it was all I really ever saw. Every time I went to work, every call I took, there was a problem. That's all the re that's the only time they call a cop, police officer, it seems, is when there's a problem. And there was somebody taking advantage of somebody, someone hurting someone, someone living only for themselves and leaving everyone else damaged in their wake. Men and women preyed on each other. And there were also the broken families, the hurting and lost children and people who had given up hope. And you could see it in their eyes. I wasn't aware of it, but that darkness I was exposed to every day and every night started to reside inside of me. So this darkness and this anger and this hatred was starting to take its toll. My blood pressure would get so high while on duty, uh, I would start to feel dizzy. I'd be fine on my days off, but as soon as I returned to work, I could feel the same feelings, the same tension, the same anger boiling inside me. In fact, I remember a winter coat drive for homeless people. And when they asked me if I had anything to donate, I was so angry at what I saw some of these homeless people doing in our city. They would throw bricks through the library windows just so the police would come up and then they would get arrested and go to jail to get a hot meal when there was a shelter nearby where they could have gotten it for free. They would steal and they would destroy things and when you offered them help they refused it and so when they asked me if I had anything to give I said kind of joking but with a little bit of truth I'd rather burn my clothes and give them to them. My heart was becoming really hard and I told my wife that something was wrong and she wisely said yeah, it's, it's you. And I knew she was right. So one night I was at home asleep. And before I had to get up to report for a uh, 5.30 a.m. shift briefing, the phone rang at 3 a.m. and I woke up with a bit of a jolt. And the night shift sergeant told me there had been an armed robbery with a hostage taken at a gas station. Our night shift guys, many of whom were my good friends and even academy classmates when I graduated the police academy, had arrived and got into a shootout with the robbers. The hostages, the hostage was wounded by the robbers, but not seriously. And one of the robbers had died on scene from the shootout with the police, but the other robber was shot multiple times, but was alive and had been taken to the hospital. All of the police fortunately were okay. The Sergeant told me to report to the hospital directly in the morning because we were gonna watch over the prisoner as he was in our custody, but he still needed medical treatment. So finally, after a week or two, the prisoner was healed enough to be transported to jail. My sergeant sent me to do the transport. I arrived at the hospital and was advised I would need to pull my patrol car up to the doors so the prisoner wouldn't have to walk too far. And then I needed to gingerly and carefully help this prisoner to his wheelchair and into my car and then deliver him safely to prison. And I could feel the rage just boiling inside of me. This prisoner, this person I looked at as scum now needed my help and protection. He needed, and he even expected me to treat him fairly, humanely, moreover, even tenderly. And yet, not but a few days ago, this prisoner would have killed one of my fellow police officers or me and had taken them from their families. He'd have killed them for no more than a couple hundred bucks and ruined their lives and the lives of their families. He would have taken these good men and noble men away from so many who loved and depended upon them. I was beside myself with anger. As the prisoner sat in the back seat of my patrol car, as I pulled away from the hospital, the prisoner complained and asked me to hurry up to the jail because he was hungry and he wanted to make sure he got to the jail in time for dinner. Then he asked me to make sure I don't take the speed bumps too fast. I have never before felt so much anger, so much hatred, so much rage towards any human being before in my life. I can tell you I wanted the worst for this prisoner, this waste of a human being as I looked at him. I didn't believe he deserved to just sit in a jail cell. I didn't believe that 
he deserved anything better than the worst. I wanted him to pay with overwhelming fear, pain. And all of this pain boiled over in my head as I began to make that final turn into the city jail. I called for a wheelchair and helped the prisoner sit down. Then I pushed him into the jail, just as I would anyone else. I stood by with my arms crossed and I just burned holes into the prisoner with my eyes as the jailers processed him into jail. I could feel that blood pulsing in my eyes as I raged inside. I left the prisoner behind in the jail in as pristine condition as I'd received him from the hospital and I drove back to the PD, the police department. I hated how I felt. I hated that I felt so much hate. I didn't understand how to process it. I knew the devil wanted me to dwell in this rage, but I could also feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit. I knew the hatred was wrong, and I prayed to God for help. And then God placed a Christian chaplain in my patrol car the very next day. We drove around the city, and calls for service were lower than normal, so we had time to talk. I don't remember exactly what he said, but I remember walking away monumentally changed. The Holy Spirit had worked through this chaplain to convict me, to change me, to break me, and to restore me all in that car ride. Suddenly, my eyes were open. This shell that had formed around my heart fell away, and these people that I hated, I now pitied. I realized that no matter how terrible their actions were, they were still children of God, his special creations, who had a capacity for good, but were broken and misled. I realized I was broken alongside them, but that I'd been saved just a wretch like me. And there was hope for them still. These were the prodigal sons who had been led away by the lies of the devil. My hate should not have been aimed at these poor lost souls, but rather it should be aimed at the devil's deeds, the lies, the insidious work to close their eyes and their hearts and minds and ears to the good news of Christianity. And the idea of spreading the good news of Christianity then played a pivotal role in my life and would play a major role in my call to become a pastor. I spent four years with the police department, and then I applied for and was selected to a federal law enforcement position. It was in this position I would realize my calling to apologetics. I was responsible for counterterrorism investigations, and as such, I was exposed to the threats originating from Islamic extremism. In day after day, I read through the lies that Islam spread, not only those to radicalize people in uh, America and abroad, but simply the lies that Islam has regarding Christianity. I want you to listen to these claims from Islam and think how you would respond. Islam claims that Abraham sacrificed Ishmael instead of Isaac, that Jesus was a prophet who was virgin born, but he was not the son of God, that Jesus was not crucified. In fact, that someone was substituted for Jesus and he hid until he could meet with the disciples. Regarding the Trinity, Muslims consider it a blasphemy signifying belief in three gods. In Islam, the Trinity is mistakenly thought to be God, Jesus, and Mary. Regarding the resurrection, since Muslims do not believe in the crucifixion, there's no need to believe in the resurrection. Regarding salvation, salvation is achieved in Islam by submitting to the will of Allah. There's no assurance of salvation. It's granted by Allah's mercy alone. And regarding the Quran, it's a later revelation that supersedes and corrects errors in the Bible. And finally, regarding Muhammad, He's the last in the line of prophets and therefore the final authority in spiritual matters. You see, I knew all these statements were false, but I I couldn't formulate a cogent response. If someone asked me to defend my faith and give a reason why these things aren't true and why mine is, I didn't know where to point. I didn't know how to formulate uh, a defense, an apologia. So I started off finding a radio show by a man named Hank Hanegraaff. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, but it's called The Bible Answer Man. I would go in my car during lunchtime, sometimes during the day, and I'd get a Subway sandwich and sit and listen to about a 45-minute radio show. And the host would answer callers' questions regarding the Christian faith. And the show was excellent. But I started to desire more. I found the answers were light, and they were sufficient for a radio call-in show, but I really wanted to find out more. And this led me to the work of Dr. William Lane Craig, who, as many of you know, leads the Reasonable Faith Ministry. And now I found his work to be deeply interesting, to be challenging, thorough, fulfilling. And I listened to Dr. Craig's Defender series endlessly. Never before had I found such a comprehensive presentation for the truth of the Christian faith, one that would address the philosophical and scientific evidence and answer those challenging questions. And it satisfied a thirst for knowledge that so many of us have. 
whether we want to admit it or not. So over the course of the next few years, I studied every moment of free time I had, as I still do now. As I mentioned, God had concreted in me a hope which I could rely upon during even the darkest times. And through study, I could now better provide a defense for the hope that was in me. I could answer those questions. I could demonstrate the truth. I could demonstrate the truth of the Christian faith, and I could show why other faiths fail to meet that true standard. Over time, I've realized how I'm able to blend these various roles and callings God has placed in my life. God has called me into a career in law enforcement. He's called me into my role as a husband and as a father to our precocious seven-year-old boy. So how then is apologetics relevant to me? Well, from a law enforcement perspective, as I investigated cases, I'm always amazed, unfortunately, at the depravity in society. It saddens me to see us give in to our sinful desires. As we remove God, the Christian faith, God's intention for marriage, God's intention for the family, and how we to raise our children, we will slide further and further into a willingness not only to commit sin, but to call what is sin good. From an apologetics perspective, let us consider the moral argument. It states in various fashions that there are objective moral obligations or laws. If there are objective moral obligations, then there is a God who explains these obligations. Then there is a God. Or as Frank Turek, uh, a Christian apologist who speaks fast and energetically, plainly states, if there's one thing that is wrong at all times, in all places, if there's one objective moral law, then there's an objective moral law giver. And that moral law giver stands outside of space and time. And that moral law giver is God. But there are some in society who would claim that morality is all subjective and that there is no real good or evil, that everything else is just relatively meaningless. I find it hard to believe that these moral relativists or at worst nihilists could stand in the face of true evil and still hold that there's nothing, that there, that there is nothing, that there's no objective moral laws. You see, as a law enforcement officer, I've had to respond to some truly terrible crimes. Two of the worst, though, I had to deal with the death of children, young, innocent children. In one case, a grown adult male family member had raped a child, approximately a year old, and because of the trauma, the child had died. In the second case, a young father was at home and was supposed to be watching over his young child. The father was drinking heavily and played video games, and the child wouldn't stop crying. So the father smothered the child to a death with a pillow. I simply cannot believe anyone would consider such acts as only relatively bad or morally neutral. These innocent children suffered at the hands of those that they should have been able to trust most, and they were unjustly murdered. Imagine walking into a room and having to see the trauma the child suffered. Imagine interviewing the person who committed such atrocious acts and watching and hearing them lie to cover up what they know to be absolutely wrong and evil. As they lie, their hearts race, sweat pours from their brow because they know what they've done is pure evil. And they know it's not just illegal. It's not just an unpopular opinion. Imagine having to notify others who still love those children, who will miss those children gone before they could almost even begin. Gone far, far too soon. Here we see what I believe is an excellent example of an objective moral law, that it is wrong. It is wrong at all times, in all places, to murder a child for pleasure or because they're a mere temporary inconvenience. And I would challenge anyone to say otherwise. Here we see that those moral laws are written upon our hearts. As we read in Romans 2.15, they show that the work of the law is written on their hearts. Their consciences confirm this. I propose that anyone who might argue otherwise, who would say that it's okay to murder, murder innocent children for pleasure, for convenience sake, that it's no different than chopping down a tree or for any other reason, we would conclude that they're psychopaths. That is, per the definition of psychopath, they are suffering from a mental disorder so that they lack the commonly expected capacities for human empathy and understanding of guilt. That is what Romans 2.15 says. It's written on our hearts and minds, the law, and we know it to be wrong and right. And here we see what a psychopath is. And I further propose that anyone who might claim all moral claims are simply subjective and are no different, as Dr. Craig says, than the preferred flavor of ice cream, that these aren't persons we would ultimately feel comfortable having walking around freely in society. Would you trust your child with a babysitter who sees nothing objectively wrong with torturing a child for pleasure? 
Would you want to marry someone who believes that they can do whatever they want, that they can treat anyone emotionally and physically however they want to include physical and emotional abuse and torture, all the while claiming there's nothing objectively right or wrong, good or evil beyond societal norms or laws? I assume the answer is no. And if, I, uh, if someone were to answer yes, I would be greatly concerned. But rarely can someone say with a straight face they believe the murder of those innocent children meant nothing and was not wrong. How is apologetics relevant to me as a husband? As a husband, it's not so much that the arguments of apologetics have been beneficial. Rather, it's the grounding of finding my calling in apologetics and to serve the Lord as a pastor and apologist have been beneficial to our marriage. You see, before I came to realize and appreciate how much God loved me, I was comparatively a lukewarm Christian, going through the motions, but keeping only a semblance of the flame alive. I cussed and I told dirty jokes and I had anger beyond righteous rage. I was content going to church and praying, but I not fully embraced the life God desired for me and for us and for others. My wife and I had been married for about seven years. and We've been married for, I think, going on 18 now. We've been married since 2004. You do the math. <laughs> and I had never really taken the leadership and ownership of our faith. And I knew the Bible commanded of a man. So I began to seek out how I could lead my wife and what church we could attend. I never realized the journey God had planned for us. We joined a weekly church group, a small church family, which sharpened our faith and strengthened and supported us. And over the next few years, my wife and I grew closer. And in 2013 through 2014, God took all of this preparation and the love and the faith he had built into my wife and I and blessed us to go through an amazing and difficult journey of having a child. Through all the fear, stress, tears, and finally, joy, God was always there with us, protecting us, carrying us through something we could have never done without his awesome strength, grace, and love. And we were blessed with a healthy, happy baby boy. You see, realizing God's calling on my life to serve him helped me realize what was important in our life. In doing so, it removes those distractions that come with pursuing fulfillment through our careers or hobbies. It's helped me to realize one of the first callings of my life is to cherish the wife the Lord has given me. And what is important is not how she fulfills my needs and desires, but how I can help her fulfill the calling God has placed on her life. And as a father, when our son was four years old, he loved talking about space, and he still does. The planets, the stars, pulsars, quasars, and everything in between. And he would astound me every day. One day he asked me, Daddy, how many kilometers is Arcturus? And I said, son, you have to clarify, do you mean kilometers away from the earth or in circumference or in diameter? And my son thought about it and he said, circumference. And I said, I'm sorry, son, I don't know why I asked you to clarify. I don't know any of those answers anyhow, but we can look it up. You see, far more than stars, though, I love when our family takes the time or has an unexpected opportunity to talk about God and our Christian faith, be it in the grocery store while putting our son to bed, camping, or as we do a lot in Alaska, or just driving down the road. I'm so proud when I hear my son recite his Bible verses each week from memory in his Tuesday night kids small group, or when I hear my wife working with him to learn the verse, but more importantly, when we teach him how to understand and apply the verse. We encourage his questions and want him to have a Holy Spirit-inspired faith based on reason, based on the special and natural revelation God has given to us, to know he is true and real. In fact, one night I remember I was about to give a presentation at a reasonable faith uh, meeting here in Alaska. I'm just putting my son to bed and I'm older now, so I need to get my sleep and I'm putting him to bed. And that's right when his mind is racing the most. And he said to me, daddy, have you ever heard of a hotel where infinite people can move in and infinite people can move out and there's room, but there's not room. And I said, are you talking about Hilbert's hotel? He said, how do you know about Hilbert's Hotel? And I said, how do you know about Hilbert's Hotel? Nonetheless, he had seen a video on YouTube and he was asking me about Hilbert's Hotel and I was explaining how it demonstrated the absurdity of the infinite. But it's 10, 15, I want to go to sleep. But how can I tell him not to ask? How can I tell him not to inquire? I asked if he could maybe inquire more in the morning, but I wanted to foster his, his inquiry. You see, children have that natural seeking, right? And if we can give them answers, if we can give them reasons, we can help them to have a faith later on, which I'll talk about, that they can rely upon and that won't be as challenged in college or when they're adults. 
But unfortunately, I hear many Christians and non-Christians tell of how they were told to just believe or how there's no need to question. There's no need for questions like that. As much as I wish this wasn't true, I have witnessed too many people speak of an earnest wisdom seeking heart, mind, and spirit, which had cold water poured upon it because another Christian felt their question was inappropriate. Sadly, more often than not, we sometimes just did not understand the question or know the answer, and we were just afraid to admit it. In an article by the Gospel Coalition, the following quote was posted from Francis Schaeffer. It says, but someone will say, didn't Jesus say that to be saved, you have to be as a little child? Well, of course he did. But did you ever see a little child who didn't ask questions? People who use this argument must never have listened to a little child or been one. Francis Schaeffer says, my four children gave me a harder time with their endless flow of questions than a university of people ever have. What Jesus was talking about is that the little child, when he has an adequate answer, accepts the answer. He has the simplicity of not, of not having a built-in grid, whereby regardless of the validity of the answer, he rejects it. All of this is to say two things as a father and a, of my son, that we must prioritize and nurture our children's faith, reassuring them that there are answers to their questions and supporting and encouraging their seeking of knowledge. We must remember as adults our own call to childlike faith, to continue to be curious but trusting in God, we must remember that there are many new Christians with a young faith who may be struggling or working through questions, doubts, and thoughts for the first time, regardless of their age. With the Christian who is seeking answers, we must have the same patience, grace, and desire to disciple that we have with our own children, and even more, the, the same patience that Jesus has with us. As a father, apologetics plays a constant role in nurturing the unending questions regarding everything from heaven, salvation, the Trinity, the multiverse, and anything else imaginable. As a father, I'm able to provide an environment where our son can grow his faith and feel rest assured he is not expected to have a blind faith. Rather, he is to have a faith that is rooted in reason and is supported by all that special and general revelation have to reveal. I'm gonna follow up with another story real quick about <clears throat> uh, from, from law enforcement. I told you about the time when the uh, person had done nothing to me, but they potentially tried to kill some of my friends and how angry I felt towards them. Well, fast forward to a different time. We were on a SWAT operation and we went to hit a drug stash house. And as we go to uh, do the SWAT operation on this drug stash house, we knock, we announce, the lights go on. We let everybody know that we're there and then we have to breach the door and that's my job. So the breacher carries the ram and the saws and the halligans and all those tools and they come up and they're gonna, they're gonna tear the door down, knock it in, open it. Uh, of course, little known fact, the fastest way to open a door is when it's unlocked and you just open it, but it's also the most boring way. But as we go up to the door, it's a huge cinder block walls with reinforced metal gates, big thick bars, and we have to have this big cut saw. It's a large saw with a blade Oh, I don't know, about 14, 15 inches in um, diameter. And we start the saw and we fire that saw up and start cutting away at the bars. And the whole time we're announcing there's police lights and we're letting the person know that we're there. And all of a sudden we look and we start seeing pop, 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 pop. And I look and I think, oh, that's weird. The saw must be kicking back as it cuts through the metal. And one of the uh, older SWAT agents says, I think we're being shot at in a rather calm voice. And so now we realize that there are uh, rounds coming through the door on the other side. And when I go back and look, there's a round here, there's a round here, there's a round here, everywhere but where I was, there was a few rounds. And, uh, in between the guy next to me that was cutting with the saw. So we have to retreat back and we get behind cover and then we have to continue with the operation. And we end up tearing down the door with some hooks and getting the guy out and the guy had been trying to protect his stash house and had a um, daughter in there that he was using as cover. All this to say that at the end of it, I wasn't mad at him, right? Because I, I know in the end, um, the hope that I have in Jesus. And I know that this person lacks that hope. Moreover, I pitied this person. And so now when we bring it back full circle and we look, my being able to defend my faith because people are going to ask 
how do you act like that? How, how, how can you not be mad? Well, I was, I was upset at what had occurred. I thought that, you know, there should be a prosecution and consequences under the law, but I didn't, I didn't personally hate that person. If that person was different time, uh, on a different circumstance and they came to Christ and let's say their name was Bob. Hi, Bob. Glad to have you at church. And I see them later and they've come to Christ and they've changed their life. We're glad to have you. I felt no animus towards that person because now I had a hope that's within me. But now that once people see that hope that's within you, that's what you're going to have to defend. Those are the reasons that you're going to have to give. That's an excellent time for us to minister to people. And that brings us to three ways that apologetics can have a real effect on our lives. How can we then focus our efforts? It's helpful to look at Dr. William Lane Craig's three focal points for Christian apologists. You see, Christian apologetics is vital in shaping culture. It's vital in strengthening believers, and it's vital in evangelizing unbelievers. Regarding shaping the culture, as Christian apologists, we must realize the constant insidious efforts by the devil to tear apart at Christian values which hold society together. As Dr. Craig points out, in general, Western culture is deeply and unfortunately post-Christian. This is primarily a result of the Enlightenment, which introduced an ardent secularism that is not only infected, but has at least affected the whole of Western society. You see, we can see the effects of modernistic thinking playing out in society as definitions for our most basic things, such as marriage, family, what is a male or a female, and sexuality are being constantly redefined to the point of losing any definition or constraints whatsoever. The Enlightenment mentality left a scar so that the Western intellectuals no longer considered theological knowledge to be possible it was concluded that theology was not a source of genuine knowledge, since knowledge could only come from the physical sciences, and therefore theology was no longer a science, or scientia, which is the Latin word for knowledge. Therefore, anyone who pursued knowledge would inevitably theologically find themselves an atheist, or at best an agnostic. But how are we to correct these incredibly incorrect conclusions? Well, we must, as Christians and Christian apologists, demonstrate how everybody Every body of knowledge, the, from the physical sciences, philosophy, history, and others, all point to the history of the Christian faith. We must serve as ambassadors of the Christian faith. You see, Charles Malik, the Lebanese ambassador to the United States, in his article titled The Other Side of Evangelism, published in 1980 in Christianity Today, stated, I must be frank with you. The greatest danger confronting American evangelical Christianity is the danger of anti-intellectualism. You see, the mind in its, in its greatest and deepest reaches is not cared for enough. The result is that the arena of creative thinking is vacated and abdicated to the enemy. For the sake of greater effectiveness in witnessing to Jesus Christ himself, as well as for their own sakes, evangelicals cannot afford to keep on living on the periphery of responsible intellectual existence. Dr. Craig further points out that we are aware of the continual push and movement within various segments of society, which seek to counter Judeo-Christian values and morals. Moreover, some seek to completely remove the idea of faith from society at all, specifically from the halls of academia. Dr. Craig states that the so-called new atheists, like Christopher Hitchens, Sam Harris, and Richard Dawkins, go even further. They want to exterminate religious belief entirely from American society. Dr. Craig says, quote, so why should we care about the culture, what our culture thinks of us Christians? Why can't we just be faithful followers of Christ and live for him in the midst of a culture that's going to be, that's going to hell in a handbasket? Why should we care what the cultural elite think of us Christians? <clears throat> why not preach the gospel to a dark, why preach, why not just preach the gospel to a dark and dying world? Well, the answer is because the gospel is never heard in isolation. The gospels always heard against the cultural backdrop in which a person was born and raised. A person who was raised in a culture which is sympathetic to the Christian faith will be open to the gospel in a way that a person who was raised in a secular culture will not. <laughs> For a person who is thoroughly secularized, you may as well tell him to believe in Santa Claus or the tooth fairy, as in Jesus Christ. It will seem absurd to him. Regarding strengthening believers, as I mentioned, apologetics has played a role in helping me as a father to strengthen my son's faith. And he learns as he learns and explores about the universe God has created for us. Apologetics will play a critical role in preparing and strengthening the faith of our youth. This is a major focus of mine now. 
The lies of our culture are affecting our children. Even if you believe you cannot argue someone into heaven, it is obvious children, teenagers, young and old adults are being argued away from Christ. In her book, Mama Bear Apologetics, Hillary Morgan Ferrer states, it's easy to miss the importance of apologetics if you haven't witnessed the sheer number of victims being held captive by bad philosophy. And she also says, apologetics may not seem important until you witness firsthand the consequences of bad ideas. If you've ever heard of the youth exodus, this refers to the number of Christian youth nationwide that later stop attending church. Did you know that almost 50% of the youth leave the church after their freshman year in college and never return? Or did you know that 60% of young Christians are disconnected from their church at, after age 15? Or that 61% of 20-somethings who had attended church as teens are no longer spiritually engaged? And 70% of teens who attended youth group when they were young stopped attending church within two years of high school graduation? Ferrer points out that for many years, most people assume that the problem originated in college. But this is probably because that's when the church attendance numbers take their most drastic drop. But, that, but what we must take into account is the fact that once the child is in college, no longer is mom and dad rounding everyone up on Sunday mornings and taking them to church every week. Certainly, while some college environments remain a contributing factor, these, excuse me, Sorry about that, excuse me. Uh, certainly while some college environments remain a contributing factor, these numbers of youth who stop being engaged in the Christian faith are an external manifestation of an internal disconnection that started years earlier. That is to say, as Ferrer points out, the ticket to leave church was or may have already been purchased. College was just the first opportunity to use it. Moreover, in three independent surveys, it was real, revealed that 41% of teens were uncertain whether Jesus was physically resurrected. 63% of teens didn't believe Jesus to be the son of the one true God. And 33% of teens believe that Jesus is not the only way to heaven. These are core Christian doctrinal matters that pertain directly to one's salvation. These are matters of the mind. These are matters of the intellect. These youth were unable to refute the philosophy of the world's accusations against Christianity. These youth were unprepared to give reasons for their faith. How can someone have a saving faith if they're unsure who Jesus was and if they're unsure if we can rely on scripture to learn about him? Some of us may think it's just a phase and that the kids will eventually return to their faith. But a survey by Lifeway found that out of the 70% of teens who left church during their college years, only about half of them eventually returned. This is because they never really knew what they said they believed. These poor kids never really believed anything other than a loosely held set of things generally associated with Christianity. And at the first strong winds of attack, those anchors just let loose. And the children were moved with the cultural winds away from Christ. Our children need a faith rooted in reason, a faith they can understand and rely upon when they face questioning, which either directly or indirectly they are sure to face. And finally, regarding evangelizing unbelievers. It is true that the culture is hard to reach, especially a culture sliding further into relativism, secularism, and away from Judeo-Christian values. Despite these false philosophies, which have lured and hold unbelievers and misguided Christians away from the truth, some may still say, well, you'll never argue someone into heaven. And while I understand their sediment, this is a gross oversimplification of Christian apologetics, and moreover, is giving up before you've ever tried. There's an abundance of evidence demonstrating apologetics is not only important in preventing cultural intellectual decay regarding the viability of Christian theism, but it can also bring unbelievers to faith and strengthen the faith of Christians. Certainly apologetics without the gospel is insufficient, but men of God with minds greater than mine have recognized the role apologetics plays in evangel evangelism. These men have played an incredible role in advancing the kingdom. And while they're not professional Christian apologists, their respect for and use of apologetics is telling and should be held in high regard. Francis Schaeffer, who I quoted earlier, the late philosopher and theologian, considered apologetics pre-evangelism, wherein apologetics served as a springboard to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Or Oxford theologian Alistair McGrath parallels the sentiment in his book, Mere Apologetics, 
where he states, apologetics lays the ground for the invitation. Evangelism extends it. It's one thing to argue that arguments cannot make a person believe, but quite another to argue from this fact that arguments have no part in the process of moving a person towards faith. In the words of Gresham Machen, but because argument is insufficient, it does not follow that it is unnecessary. What the Holy Spirit does in the new birth is not make a person a Christian regardless of the evidence, but on the contrary, to clear away the mist from the, his eyes and enable him to attend to the evidence. Furthermore, in the words of Peter Craft and Ronald Tassili, arguments may not bring you to faith, but they can certainly keep you away from the faith. Therefore, we must join the battle of arguments. A battle of arguments is exactly where we find ourselves today, and the devil is playing upon a culture of anti-intellectualism to prevent people from seeking truth and finding God. Dr. Craig spoke on the topic of Americans and Christians being stuck in intellectual neutral. He referenced Ellen Bloom in Bloom's book, The Closing of the American Mind, where Bloom states, quote, there is one thing a professor can be absolutely certain of. Almost every student entering the university believes or says he believes that truth is relevant. If this belief is put to the test, one can count on the student's reaction. They will be uncomprehending that anyone should regard the proposition as not self-evident astonishes them, as though he were calling into question two plus two equals four. These are things you don't think about. The danger they have been taught to fear is not error, but intolerance. Relativism is necessary to openness, and this is the virtue, the only virtue, which all primary education for more than 50 years has dedicated itself to inculcating into our children. Openness, and the relativism that makes it plausible is the great insight of our times. The study of history and culture teaches that all the world was mad in the past, that men always thought about thought they were right, and that led to wars, persecutions, slavery, xenophobia, racism, and chauvinism. The point is not to correct the mistakes and really be right. Rather, it is not to think you're right at all." End quote. What should we all, what we should what we should all find more concerning is that this book was written in 1987. How much more so do these sentiments apply in today's age, particularly as we reflect on the theme for this apologetics conference? Dr. Craig concludes, since there is no absolute truth, since everything is relative, then the purpose of education is not to learn truth or master facts. Rather, it is simply to acquire a skill so that one can go out and obtain wealth, power, and fame. Truth has become irrelevant. He goes on to ask, quote, what then can we make of John 14, 6, where Jesus instructs, I am the truth, end quote. A relativist standard of truth is completely contrary to Christian worldview. Dr. Craig elaborates, therefore, the Christian can never look on the truth with apathy or disdain. Rather, we cherish and treasure the truth as a reflection of God himself. Nor does a commitment to truth make you intolerant, as Bloom students thought. The traditional understanding of tolerance is that while I may disagree with what you say, nevertheless, I will defend to the death your right to say it. The problem is that the understanding of tolerance in our politically correct society has now changed. Today, tolerance means I dare not disagree with what you say, lest I be branded as bigoted and intolerant for daring to do so. But this new understanding of tolerance is logically incoherent when you think about it. Think about it. If you tolerate a view, then the very concept of tolerance presupposes that you think the tolerated view is not true. Otherwise, you wouldn't tolerate it, you would agree with it. You can only tolerate a view that you regard as false. So the very concept of tolerance entails a commitment to truth. The Christian is both commitment to truth and to tolerance. For we believe in him who said not only that I am the truth, but also love your enemies. The correct basis of tolerance is not relativism, but love. End quote. If we do not stem the tide of society sliding into secularism as our predecessors in Europe have done, it will become increasingly more difficult to share the gospel. But if the gospel is to be a viable option for thinking men and women, we as Christians, particularly as Christian thinkers, scientists and apologists must present the Christian faith and worldview as an intellectually defensible alternative. We must prepare each and every Christian to be ready to enter the marketplace of ideas and to be able to give good answers with solid and right thinking to the common and sometimes difficult and aggressive questions and objections. Now, I thank you for your time and I'm 
Looking forward to any questions. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much, Chris. That was very insightful, the way you tied out the relevance of apologetics across your three fields and careers. Um, well, I want to open up the time now for questions that anyone may have. If there's anything that you want Chris to clarify, if there's anything that you want Chris to address. So, well, this question from Kavish, I hope Chris, you can see it. It says, I frequently feel saturated with the amount of information available and the complex terms amongst others in the field of apologetics. What is a systematic way to pursue this field and how to get avoid getting overwhelmed by the volume of information? That's a that's a very relevant question, Kavish. So, Chris, what do you say? Sorry, that's a great question, uh, Kavish. I think one way, and this happens to, I would say I'm a, I'm a, I don't know, I've been on apologetics since maybe 2012 now, and uh, I'm still learning. You know, I, I'm still, I still feel like I'm sometimes in an ocean of information and I don't know where to go. Right now I'm working on writing a paper uh, regarding Genesis, Adam and Eve, and there's so many areas that you can look at for research. So <clears throat> I follow what I think Dr. Craig and others have done, and they try to narrow their focus and a little bit like putting blinders on a horse where I'm going to read this book, right? Let's imagine I have, they're all over the place here. I have books like uh, Person of Interest that just came out or Tactics, right? I would, I would take, depending on where you are in your apologetics journey, I would sometimes just focus on one book at a time. Uh, sometimes I get distracted by trying to listen to podcasts and trying to watch YouTube videos and trying to read books. And then my brain is thinking, oh, what did that podcast say? And what did that YouTube video say? And I want to start researching that. And then I get halfway through a book and I, I just have a, a, a bookmark in there and I never come back to it. Uh, I think when you're first getting started, finding uh, a clear path like Dr. Craig's Defender series. It's a whole system of learning. And if you can work through that and then say, okay, I'd like to learn more about, and then pick that topic and then read a book about that. Uh, otherwise you're just gonna get tossed to and fro out of uh, good intentions, but uh, it, it can be frustrating at times. I remember I was reading Dr. Craig's book on time I think it's called God, Time, and Eternity, and I stopped reading it because I had to go read a book. I had to go read a few books on science to understand the terms better. So I can definitely understand that the the terms are really complex. But uh, just work your way through a few of the. I'm, I'm not sure where you are, Kavish. Uh, you you may be far more advanced than I am in in your uh, in your studying the multiverse theory and string theory, but. I would say just give yourself some focus uh, on one one at a time and uh, start to build up your vocabulary and exposure. Thank you, Chris. Thank you for the question. Um, you can continue to drop the questions in the chat. And uh, if you want sure. me to read it out without calling out your name, then you can drop it to me personally. So I'll, sure, I'll, I'll see. Yeah. I see this one from Ajit Abraham. Yeah, okay. It says, if all apologetics is so important, is being taught in the churches? If yes, what's the best way? If not, why? That's a great question. Apologetics is really important, but one of the things that I find it out, oh, uh, sorry, is that pastors are overwhelmed with the amount of tasks that they're expected to perform, right? A pastor is supposed to be everything to everybody, and the expectation to be an apologist is, is what I consider a bit of a niche field. Uh, I think you'll find that many apologists aren't great therapists, right? They're, they're usually thinkers and uh, they're maybe philosophers or scientists. And if somebody were to come to them and say, you know, my, I'm having trouble with our 13 year old son, or I'm having trouble with our marriage or alcoholism, or I'm homeless. Sometimes the apologist doesn't, I don't have the resources or the training to do this. Well, I think a lot of the times some of our senior pastors they have a wide breadth and depth of understanding. Um, and then if you come to them, if they're not already a Christian apologist by trade or by training, if you come to them and you say, well, we need apologetics in our church, 
that's just another, you know, another brick in their bag that says, hey, this is another thing we need. So the best way I think to do it is to say, we need apologetics in our church, and I'm here to do it. Um, if you find that there's not a program in the church, you don't have to be an expert in apologetics. There are plenty of experts out there. That's one of the things that I tell our church members is you don't have to know the answer. Just know that there is an answer, right? Know that there are resources and I'll be your resource. So our senior pastor at our church, Mark Goodman, and all the pastors at our church are wonderful in that they support reasonable faith and they support apologetics ministry and they've allowed me to preach at the church and they've allowed me to use their resources. And I just say, listen, I'm going to start up a program and I'm going to be your resource. And if you ever have anybody that has questions, point them to me. And if you want to be that person, be that person. And when they come to you with questions, reach out to us, right? If if reach out to Jacob and say, I, I have a question. I don't know where to find a resource. And he'll start to show you, the, show you those resources. And like Kavish was saying, over time, you'll find out where to get those resources, right? You'll find out how to search reasonable faith, how to search um, Mike Lacona's work, how to search Frank Turek's pages, One Minute Apologist. You'll find all these this breadth of resources to be able to give back to the communities of the church. But just that question itself, uh, maybe God's given you a little bit of uh, conviction to, to be an apologist, uh, Mr. Abram. Thank you. This, this another question that has come in. What do you do when you know someone who does not want an answer? They don't want an answer? Yeah. Someone who does not want an answer. So could you explain that a little bit further? I think I understand what you mean. Could you explain that though? I think it's sort of like, you know, they they are ready to ask questions, but they're not willing to listen. They're not really seeking out the answer. Um, but they are they're fine with asking questions. They don't sure, have sure. Any, any any sort of limit to questions. So what do we what do we do there? Uh, a, f- a few things. Um, you know, one of the answers is always pray, right? Pray that 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 venom that they're really kind of using, right? It's a tactic to to keep you off uh, on the on your heels. Um, that that fades away. Uh, Frank Turk does a great job. And when he hears that somebody is just launching attacks, launching attacks of questions, he says, wait, 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 wait. If Christianity was true, would you believe it? Right? And some people will say, no. Yes, maybe. Right? It really kind of puts it back on them. Or you can ask, how does that prevent you from becoming a Christian? Right? If, if, uh, if the question's about evolution or about uh, the multiverse, or you say, you know, really it boils down to if Jesus really was, and you can ask those, those questions, how is this question that you're asking me preventing you from being a Christian? Well, it's not. Well, what is? What is that question? What's, and I've asked people, ask me the one thing that prevents you from being a Christian. Oftentimes, it's an emotional matter rather than actually an intellectual matter. But, uh, if, if they're just shooting up a smoke screen, try to be aware of that because somebody can ask, and I remember an example given was, somebody can ask any question they want. Well, how many leaves are on the tree outside? And then you could spend a month figuring out how many leaves are on the tree outside. And then, well, well how many leaves are on the other tree outside? They could ask you endless questions, try to find out their motivation behind it. Is that really what's stopping you? Thank you. One more question it asks it's from Ajit Abraham himself. How important it is to know other religions well while we present apologetics? Uh, it, it, it is important to know other religions well, but not as important as it is to know Christianity well. Uh, I would really work on, on understanding the truths of our faith so we don't get tripped up out there with another... When, when we're encountering another religion so that it seems like we don't know our faith. But if you're going to specialize in ministry to another religion, I would really work on hammering out some of those uh, basics. Like when I talked about Islam, right? I want to do a comparison and contrast uh, between Islam and Christianity, or if it was Hindu, or if it was uh, Mormons, I do want to spend some time knowing those other religions, at least to understand what I'm going into and what it is that they believe. 
I want to be careful that I don't tell them what they believe, that I hear what it is that they believe. Uh, oftentimes, adherents to various religions, just like unfortunately with Christianity, don't exactly know what it is that their religion claims to be true. Uh, I've heard it said sometimes that, you know, many Catholics are bad Catholics and good Christians, or some Mormons truly think that they believe the same as Christianity and they've never been exposed to a difference. Uh, when I've talked to people who believe in uh, Islam, uh, they thought absolutely that those claims were held across the board, that Abraham you know, sacrificed Ishmael and that there was no question about it. And I said, no, you know, it says in the Bible differently. Uh, some of them had been prevented from doing their own research. So uh, let, know what you expect them to believe if you're going to be going out and doing that particularly, but also ask them to explain what it is that they believe. Yeah. Um... And we've got another question coming and I know that you can all see the questions, but I'm just reading out for sake of our members who sure. can join us and are listening in on the recording. The next question is from Shubra John. He asks, the dominant fervor these days are that of cancel culture, where everything becomes offensive and freedom of speech is at stake. In this context, would you explain on to sending truth with tolerance without being offensive? Well, yes, this is something that I work at I try to work at doing this really well in, in my own life because I do take clear stands on some of the things that we talked about, God's position on, you know, God's intended instruction for marriage, uh, for family, for the, the husband's role and the wife's role. And if we can prevent them, if we can present them in a winsome way, uh, if we can present them in a genuine way, I think oftentimes they don't come across as being hateful or, or, or mean or, but the, it's up to the receiver if they're gonna say that you're being intolerant. At, at some point, we, we can't do anything else. If they assume that you're full of hate, if they assume that you're being intolerant in, in a negative way, uh, we can't always overcome that. We can do the best we can though. I start off by saying, you believe and state that this is correct. And I believe in state that this is correct. Is that, is that right? You know, they often would say yes. And then I could say, okay, if you believe one thing and I believe something else, then you either are intolerant of mine or tolerant of mine in the same way. I'm intolerant of yours or tolerant of yours. Now, I'm not stopping you from doing it right now. I'm not, I'm not physically stopping you from doing it. I'm not, but so I'm obviously tolerating your viewpoint. Uh, and I, I will go through examples of how uh, we can tolerate things that we don't think are correct. And then we can also work to stop things that, that we uh, don't think are correct. But I try to have a very genuine but honest conversation, realizing though that there are some people who are, are going to take a position that you can't overcome there on site right? You're not going to be able to overcome in that conversation with them their predisposed position towards you. Well, excellent, Chris. Thanks so much. And I think we don't have any other questions coming in. Um, we are six on the dot. So, are there any more questions? Oh, I think... well, thank you. Thank you. I hope that answered your question, sir. Yeah, thank you, Chris. So, that is it. That is the end of the Q&A session. So once again, thank you so much, Chris, for taking your time out. It's way early in the morning for you. But I know, but I know that you know, uh, you're going to SWAT training at all at 4 a.m. in the morning. Uh, this, is, <laughs> yes. this is not much of a hassle for you. But once again, really, thank you so much for taking your time and being here and talking to our team members here on um, the relevance of apologetics. And you presented so well. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your time. And you know, I look forward to doing it again. If you have another topic, I would love to uh, speak with you all and uh, hear from you all. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. All right. And uh, just before we take off, just want to give some quick heads up on what we have coming up next. Uh, we will be doing our sessions, the introductory module sessions, which will last six sessions, as I mentioned in the beginning. And they will happen on alternative Tuesdays from 8 to 9 p.m. They will be online because it's Tuesday night. And our next meeting will be on February 15th. 
and then we will have every alternative Tuesday till we complete the first six sessions of the introductory module, uh, post which we would like to reassess and see how we can take the forward into the core module. Um, because again, if we have the possibility to meet offline and make an hybrid arrangement for people who are not in Bangalore, splendid. Because as you can see, apart from Ankit, who is our executive director at SAFT, who is joining in from Calcutta, everyone else is part of the WCC church. So we have a close knit group of people with whom we can work and engage and we open and you know provide a platform for discussion and be casual about it. So we really want to tap into the offline um, aspect of it. So we will be working with the church leadership to try and figure out what best works for everyone. And the next time when we meet up on February 15th, we will be looking at one of the books that Chris cited, uh, Tactics. We will be looking at on how we can tactically present the gospel, how we can share the gospel in a skilled manner. There is Chris is holding it up. Um, so it's a brilliant book. It's a brilliant book on sharing the gospel confidently. And one of the questions was about how do you share the gospel without being offensive, but being tolerant. So the book Tactics actually walks you through to be in a in amicable, casual, loving control seat of the conversation and to present the gospel with more clarity. Um, the other details are, um, we would actually love for everyone who has registered, we have 17 registrations so far, we would really love for all of you to continue attend all of the sessions till the very end because we will be providing official reasonable faith certificates to all the members who are completing it. Um, and so those will be coming, those will be officially signed by the global chapter directors. Um, so we would actually really encourage you to stick through and, and that will enable us to give you the certificate as well. And uh, that's just about it. Um, so we will keep you updated in the group about the next meeting timing, the links and as such. So once again, thank you so much for being here. And I would like to call upon our pastor, Pastor Nibu, to um, give the benediction. Shall we look into the Lord in prayer? Father, we thank you and we are so grateful for this evening that you've given to us together. Lord, we are so blessed to uh, hear from your servant of Father God. Uh, the, when we look around the world, Lord, as your servant has explained many a times, the situations that is around, the things that is around, Lord, kind of overwhelms our thoughts and our hearts. And uh, when we uh, don't understand some of the things that happens, there are times, Lord, Father, we got confused. We are doubtful about how things are happening. But Lord, thank you for the way that you are sovereignly working in the life of people to help them to understand the truth. At the same time, Lord, uh, thank you for speaking through your servant this evening, Lord, uh, helping us to understand the importance of uh, giving an answer uh, to the questions that we face and specifically giving uh, the reason for our hope that we have. Lord, help us, all of us, that we will continue to grow in you so the people will identify a difference in us, Lord, Father, the way that we talk, the way that we deal with the things of Father. In our all surrounding, there should be a difference that the people should watch, Lord, and help us to be true disciple of Lord Jesus Christ. We continue to pray for your servant, that you can use him, of Father, powerfully in the places where you are placing him. Lord, we pray that you will continue to speak through him to bless many people and to bring them back to the track at the same time also to give an answer to the difficult questions that people have been asking. Thank you for using your servant this evening, of Father. At the same time, we also pray for everyone those who are participating in this another uh, six, um, ten plus week. Of Father, we pray that we will continue to learn uh, things and not only to learn those things, but to put those things in practice and also uh, pray for opportunities to share our faith. Or pray for opportunities to share this hope to the people those who are living in this hopeless world, the Lord. We pray, Lord, that you uh, uh, help us to uh, pursue and to finish this entire course uh, without any kind of difficulties. We'll be able to attend the entire uh, course, Lord Father, and also to learn many things. And so that will truly help us in this journey, your Master. Thank you for helping us. Thank you for Jacob, who's also uh, uh, going to lead from this coming week onwards. So, Father, I keep your child a lot. You see my claim among us, your Master, so that. Uh, the truth can be spoken to our heart again and again. So we will know what we believe. And we are not believing in uh, in some some something which is not true, but rather we believe in something which have concrete and very clear evidences for the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your presence, Spirit. Uh, thank you for, and we commit the rest of the evening in your mighty hand. We also pray and ask for the tomorrow service. It should be a great blessing in asking your presence over our lives, O Master. Giving you all the glory, honor, and praises unto you. Thank you for listening to our prayers. In the name of Jesus, we all pray together.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Amen. Thank you, Chris. Amen. Take care. God bless.